So anyway, um, it, it's good to, uh, to be with you today. Um, I'm calling this presentation Public Speaking Essentials. Uh, why Essentials? Uh, because I've looked over all my material, I've, I've looked over what I do each semester, all my my power, my slideshows, and uh, the five five topics here are to me probably um, the most important and the most commonly ignored by my students. So uh, we're going to focus in on these: language usage, organization, transitions, uh, vocal delivery, and physical delivery. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, move on to the first one, language usage. Um, approach language usage differently in public speaking than you would in academic writing. A speech is not an essay. Um, I like this, a speech is not an essay, uh, short sentence. It's actually the title of an article in, in that appeared in the Harvard Business Review a year or two ago, and I found it online. And this is the way I actually begin my class every semester. Um, and it's, it's, it's a wonderful little thing. If you find it online, it's only two or three pages long, but it'll give you the sense, uh, kind of the sense that I'm gonna try to give you today. So um, first is language. So what's the difference? Let's take a look. Writing, we do, Often long sentences, especially in Kazakhstan, those with a Russian background. Um, <laughs> and we use sophisticated vocabulary. Actually, good writing should be a balance of long and short sentences. And we should try to avoid sophisticated vocabulary if our only reason is to try to impress the audience. So, um, but in a speech, clearly we should aim for mostly short sentences and simple vocabulary. Question, why? Can anybody help me with that? Why would it be shorter sentences and simpler vocabulary in speeches? You can either speak vocally or you can send your answers through the chat. Don't be shy. <laughs> uh, maybe it's just increased perception of the Oh, I'm sorry. Does it help to uh, more uh, increase perception of your speech when you are speaking the long sentence? It's too difficult to understand because I'm saying, and it's a clear speech is a bad perception. You can leave uh, it's different information, and uh, sometimes English language is a lot of um, pronunciation. Uh, maybe some in some cases a short sentence is better to perceive the audience. Maybe in some cases. Perfect. Uh, maybe there was a compl complicated, was a convoluted vocabulary. Maybe the audience will not uh, understand this uh, vocabulary, and the simple understand vocabulary also, help, also as well help to uh, understand the clearness of the speech of the speakers. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that, Yurik. Um, the main reason is because an audience has one time, one time to listen to you speak. Uh, in an essay, we can read it again and again. If there's a difficult paragraph, we can go over it. A long sentence, we can read it again and again. So um, that's one thing. But I like the way you brought up the fact that in our context, we're dealing with mostly non-native speakers of English. And that makes it you know, twice as important to keep our sentences short and to keep the vocabulary something that you know, the average person in the audience can understand. So um, great. So to summarize this, basically, in other words, uh, use short rather than unnecessarily long sentences. Um, certainly, we need long sentences sometimes. Um, and to use simple rather than unnecessarily complex vocabulary. OK, let's move on from that with an example. Now, I'm going to read this example to you. <clears throat> and I'm going to ask you to do something strange. Uh, close your eyes while I speak, because I don't want you to read it off the page. Uh, that way you'll see if, if you can process this. This sentence came from the introduction of a speech uh, from one of my students that I was marking just last week during the break. I'm going to read it to you and see uh, how well you can understand it. Uh, 
The machete is a four-stringed musical instrument from Portugal that got to Hawaii and was reborn there into a new instrument by three Madeiran woodworkers who changed its look and sound and by Hawaiian people who created a new nickname for it, which is the ukulele. How did you do with that? Was it easy to uh, follow and understand? Uh, it was uh, hard to understand, I think. In the beginning, it was okay. But then, as we proceeded, it got complicated. And I would have asked you to read again. If... Right. And this is exactly what happens in the minds of audience members. They have one shot, you know, to listen to what you're saying and absorb it all. And we don't even stop for a minute to say, does anybody understand this? We keep on going with our speech. As I said, this is from the introduction. So let's take a look at, at one way of addressing this issue. Here, I've revised it into four sentences. I'll read it. You can look, you, know, you can either close your eyes or read it you know, with me, look at it. But um, the machete is a four stringed musical instrument that comes from Portugal. It was brought to Hawaii by immigrants from Madeira, an island off the coast of Portugal. It was reborn there into a new instrument. Three Madeiran woodworkers changed its look and sound, and Hawaiian people created a new nickname for it, the ukulele. Easier? <laughs> I imagine you're saying yes. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, so. I, I hope this illustrates my point. Um, the vocabulary here was quite quite easy to grasp. Um, the only thing I had trouble was Madeira. So I added that sentence and I've highlighted it. So I'm gonna add a note to the screen here. Take time to explain things your audience may not know. That's another tip. Uh, often when we prepare a speech, we're doing a lot of research. And we kind of forget that audience members haven't done the same research we have. So um, I added this, this part about Madeira, an island off the coast of Portugal. Truthfully, when I was reading this student's outline and watching her speech, I stopped and got online to find out what Madeira was myself. So um, <laughs> you can see even this audience member needed more. OK. so. Um, now we're going to move on to organization. I promised you to, to have a like, short Q&As for, for each section. Um, any questions on the first section there about language usage? OK, maybe not. Great. So let's move on to organization. Um, Organization, follow the IBC format. So, so this is a bit of a departure from the first one. IBC is introduction, body, conclusion. And certainly essays follow this format. So this is the same in some ways, but in other ways it's not. Let's take a look at the IBC format. The introduction, tell them what you are going to tell them. Body, tell them. Conclusion. Tell them what you told them. Uh, I first heard this from my, my sister when I was in grade school. She was uh, in high school. She was elder, my elder sister. She was winning lots of awards in public speaking. She was an extemporaneous uh, speaker. She went to college free because she won so many financial awards. So um, I heard that first from her, but this is a pretty famous quote about how to do a speech. Um, the key here is that in public speaking, repetition is good. Um, writing follows this format too, but in writing, we can't bore the reader with too much repetition. Um, they'll get annoyed with it. But in public speaking, as we saw from the previous example, uh, the audience has only one chance to hear it. So any kind of reinforcement you can give them is good. So let's take a closer look at the pieces. So the introduction um, of a speech should include an opening that, that grabs the attention of the audience. Um, this is often called a hook. Common methods include asking a question, telling a story, making a startling statement, and using a quotation. There are others. 
but um, these are, are clearly the most common. And with each of these, you know, hooks or ways to grab the attention of an audience, there are benefits and drawbacks. There are things to be uh, good points and bad points. So asking a question um, can be good. Uh, it, it can engage the audience. It can get the wheels turning in their mind. That's, that's a good thing. Um, but, but two cautionary notes on this. It better be a good question, something that really is thought provoking. And the other thing is, you know, rhetorical questions are something that uh, speakers often make the mistake of just jumping right into answering the question. If you ask the audience to answer a question, even in their heads, you've got to count to five or 10 while they're thinking. If you quickly answer it, they will feel cheated. So um, that's, that's, a, that's an example of what I'm, you know, of the good and bad. Telling a story. Um, this is a great way to engage the audience. We all love stories because we heard so many when we were children from, from mom and dad or grandma, you know, once upon a time. Uh, what's the drawback with this one? It better be a short story because the, the introduction can't be too long. Uh, the other thing is that it should fit. I had a student last year who began his speech um, with a story and we were all engaged with this story and it was about how as a child his favorite movie was Shrek and his favorite animal in Shrek was the donkey and he went into this whole thing and finally he gets to the end of his story and announces that the topic of his speech is endangered species in Kazakhstan. And, you know, it's like there was a disconnect. I mean, there are people, students in the audience were actually looking at each other and I was too, but I, I'm the teacher, so I tried not to. Uh, but certainly donkeys are not endangered. So the connection was weak at best. So be careful about that if you're gonna start with a story. Making a startling statement is another way to grab the audience's attention. The, this one, um, the positive is, is that you are, you know, it's shocking and the audience will wake up and listen. But the drawback is that it's shocking <laughs> and you don't want to shock an audience too much. From the book that I use, there's an example of a, a student who begins a speech on uh, numbers of sexual abuse of, of women with, uh, you know, looking around the class and saying, I want everyone to think of five females that they know and love. And then there's a pause. And then the speaker says, one of them will be raped within their lifetime. Um, okay, <laughs> you got my attention. But it's kind of, I don't know, it, 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 it can rub the audience the wrong way. There's something distasteful about it. So that's the cautionary note on making a startling statement. Using Robert? A, yes. I, I, so Arujan was just asking, uh, she was asking before you, you said a little bit more about the startling statement, she wanted you to uh, describe startling. What do you mean by startling? Oh, gosh. Okay, great, wonderful. Startling basically means shocking, you know, a statistic that, you know, I don't know, um, Americans eat 4 million hamburgers every day. Oh my God, you know, that's, that's shocking. But it's not shocking in the way that the example that I just gave is shocking. Um, the example that I gave is a, is a real statistic um, about, the, about the rape. Uh, apparently, I got online line last night just to check this, approximately 20% of all women, um, you know, are raped at, at some point in their lifetime. And, and this includes, I mean, you know, rape by husbands, rape, by, you know, it's, it's not just uh, by strangers. But anyway, it's that's a startling statistic. I hope that clears it up. Okay. She um, says, thank you. Oh yeah, no problem, no problem. Yeah, stop, I, I, there is some vocabulary in here that I marked to mention, but th that wasn't one of them. So using a quotation is a commonly used uh, hook, especially by students. Um, what's the good thing? If you choose the right quote, if it's somebody the audience knows and can relate to, oh, they've got an immediate connection, great. Um, what's the drawback? you choose somebody that nobody knows, um, <laughs> or you choose a quote that doesn't quite match, it's not like a perfect fit. 
what I recommend here is always, I don't care if you, you think that 99% of the people on earth know the person that you're quoting, always explain who this person is, you know? Um, I had a student once begin a speech with uh, um, a quote by Michael Jordan, and I'm from Chicago. So, I mean, I know Michael Jordan, basketball player, famous, a lot of people know him, but he's starting to become old news. So I wonder if everyone in an audience in Kazakhstan would really know him. So I think it's important to say Michael Jordan, famous basketball player uh, in a basketball team called the Bulls from Chicago uh, in, in the United States of America. Um, you know, you can't go wrong if you supply extra information. Um, few audience members are going to be angry because you gave them a little bit too much information. Uh, and if there's one person out there who doesn't know, they will be very happy. And, uh, and if you don't address that audience member, you've lost them. Oh, Michael Jordan. Well, I don't know Michael Jordan, so I'm not going to listen anymore. Okay. So uh, let's move on. Um, more on the introduction. The introduction should also orient the listener by orient here, I mean guide the listener. It's like you're giving them a compass. You're, you're getting them comfortable in the context of your speech. So be sure to state the topic. Always have in your mind when you're writing a speech like the audience asking you questions. And that's what I've put here in the, the, the maroon, the reddish color type. So state the topic. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? That's what the audience is asking. Um, and this is how we felt when the student was telling us about the movie Shrek and his favorite uh, character, the donkey. What's this guy talking about? Will he finally announce his topic? So announce your topic sooner rather than later, but after the hook. Um, state the purpose, uh, give the audience a reason to care. Uh, that's what they're asking. Well, why should I care about this? Why should I care about endangered species in Kazakhstan? Well, you should care about endangered species in Kazakhstan because you're Kazakh, and this is part of our cultural heritage. Okay, that's a good reason to listen. Preview the main points. The audience is asking, well, help me. Where are you taking me? Um, tell them, today I'm going to cover, you know, on my topic, I'm going to cover first A and first X and then Y and then Z. Everybody is comfortable if they have a roadmap to where they're going. Um, it's kind of like a friend shows up in a car and they say, jump in and let's go for a ride. And you're riding along and, you know, they start, start going on their road to Almaty and you're like, well, well, well you know, where are we going? Don't worry. I'm going to take you on the ride of your life. Um, <laughs> well, after a while, it's not fun anymore because you want to know how far you're going down the road to Almaty and you're, you know, I didn't pack my toothbrush. I mean, how, how long are we going to be on this road? Um, so, <laughs> okay. Uh, and the, the, this is just an additional point here. The introduction of a speech should make up between 10 and 20% of a speech. So in a 10, 10 minute speech, it's only one to two minutes. Uh, in a five minute speech, only 30 seconds to one minute. This is a common error. I see this among students all the time. In a five minute speech, they might spend two, uh, two and a half minutes on the introduction. They really get into it, but um, the audience doesn't get into it. They want to, you know, a quick introduction and then get into your topic. Okay, let's uh, move on to the body. In the body of speech include between two and five main points. Um, again, this is because the audience can only absorb so much. Uh, beyond five, uh, people feel like they've gotten hit by a wave of information. Three is the magic number for some reason. Uh, it just works well. Uh, some people might ask, oh my gosh, I've got six points. When you've got six or eight or 10 or 12 points, work on combining some of them. Some may be combinable until you can get down to a reasonable number. Um, <clears throat> this, there's always an exception to this rule a colleague of mine once gave a speech where he had 10 points and I, in the introduction, I thought, oh my God, 10 points. Um, what a disaster. He's never taken public speaking course. <laughs> but he ended up doing a fine job. 
this was in the country of Myanmar where I was teaching at the time. And at that time, the government had just released its 10 uh, step roadmap to democracy. And he was actually playing off of that. So everyone had this idea in their heads about the government's uh, 10 step plan. So he, he also did the 10 steps. So, and each one was very short, so it worked. But in general, two to five main points. Um, balance the amount of time spent on each point. If you have three points, it doesn't have to be 33.3% on each point. But you know, if one point's 40, uh, then the other two would be 30 and 30, right? Uh, organize your main points in a typical order. Typical, by typical, I mean standard order. There are different ways of organizing essays and speeches. Um, and I'm gonna stop talking for a minute and ask you if you can tell me some of them. So you're asking what are the typical, what is a way to structure an essay? A way to structure an essay, a type of ordering of points. Let me, okay, I'll, I'll make it easier actually. Uh, the first assignment in my public speaking course, we interview each other. Everyone chooses a partner in the class. So if you interviewed me, for example, and reported on me to the class, um, there would be a couple different ways. I'm a human being, right? So you, you interview me, you learn about my past, my present, and my future. If you choose to present it in that way, what kind of order would that be called? Temporal, maybe. What? Uh, temporal, maybe. Logical. Temporal. Temporal. I think she means chronological. Chronological. Like time. That's the word I'm looking for. So temporal, chronological. Yeah, you've got the idea. Thank you, Aisha. <laughs> okay. Um, if you interviewed me and found it interesting that I'm a teacher and one of my, you know, hobbies or passions is travel um, and that I also have a family and three kids, so I'm a father uh, and you organize your speech that way, what would you call it? Personal. Personal, I suppose so. Um, I would call it topical. We'd have the, you know, Bob as teacher, Bob as father. Bob as traveler. So those are just some examples and I have them listed here. So chronological, topical, we have spatial order. You may be giving a speech on Kazakhstan. So uh, north, south, east, uh, west, wait, <laughs> north, south, east, west. Um, you may be giving a speech to incoming students at NU, you know, the front side of the building, the back side of the building, all the little lecture buildings in between. So that would be spatial order. Causal order, this, this speech has always two parts, causes, then effects. And uh, problem solution speech, also two parts. You identify the problem in the first part, you come up with solutions in the second part. Okay, I'll, I'll move on from here. Body, this point is really important. Use the same pattern of wording for each of the main points. We're looking for parallel structures here. Again, the audience hears this only once. Be kind to your audience. Um, we're looking for consistency in the terms that we use. Uh, so in this, let's, let's look at an example. Here's the central idea. In, in speeches, we call it the central idea. Don't be confused. It's the same as a thesis statement. We just call it something different to uh, make sure that we're staying in the context of a speech. So here's your central idea or thesis statement. Ancient nomads had difficult lives with limited diets, demanding livelihoods, and Spartan homes. So here we, we have a good preview of the main points of the speech. One point will be limited diets, one will be demanding livelihoods, and one will be Spartan homes. Spartan means simple, by the way, simple homes. Um, so here's an example of what this might look like in um, an outline of main points. So take a look at that and tell me where you can see problems with uh, you know, with, with parallel structures and uh, inconsistent terms. 
ancient nomads ate mostly meat, fruit, and nuts. Wanderers in the old world raised horses, goats, and sheep. Tent-like dwellings where early vagabonds lived are called yurts. Aisha, yes. Uh, too much paraphrasing, maybe like a synonyms like for nomads, wanderers. Yes, it's confusing. <laughs> Very good. And if you're in the audience and you hear, you know, uh, one minute on ancient nomads eating meat, fruit, and nuts, and then you move to wanderers in the old world you're going to be like me when I'm listening to my students when they use synonyms. I, I, I feel like they change topics or something, you know? So um, anyway, consistency and key terms is crucial. Uh, I think we all had a bad high school teacher who said, never use the same word twice. Uh, so we're always searching for, for synonyms. But in reality, you're helping the reader a lot if you can use the same words. Um, and the third one, Tent-like dwellings. I mean, if if what's our topic? Nomads. Nomads. Yes. So beginning that third point with tent-like dwellings makes it sound like now we're going to focus on dwellings rather than these these uh, ancient nomads. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Aisha. <laughs> so let's take a look at what it looks like when we fixed it up. We're now echoing the thesis statement. Echoing, you know, means to just use that same language and we're using parallel structures. Ancient nomads ate mostly meat, fruit, and nuts. Ancient nomads raised horses, goats, and sheep. Ancient nomads lived in, in tent-like dwellings called yurts. Um, remember that each of these points, the speaker will speak for a minute or so. So hearing ancient nomads again, is a cue that we're moving on to another point. Uh, what's the point here? In public speaking, um, repetition is good. It may look boring on paper, but it reinforces your topic and central idea, and that's good for the audience. Okay, let's look at the conclusion. A good conclusion lets the audience know you are about to finish, so announce your conclusion. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Um, you know, it kind of wakes the audience up in case they've been daydreaming, you know, in conclusion, oh my God, I, I missed the last point. I better listen closely to the summary so I can walk away with, you know, some, some greater knowledge, you know, <laughs> of this speech. Uh, it reinforces your central idea or thesis statement. Uh, it summarizes your main points. Uh, it includes a closing statement that ends your speech on a dramatic, clever, or thought-provoking note. Granted, this is a hard thing to do. One thing I encourage my students to do in this respect is to think about their topic and think about their audience and find a way to connect the two. If you can leave your audience with something to take away with them, something that hits home with them, you know, like going back to that example of endangered species in Kazakhstan, you know, hey, this matters to us. We are Kazakhs. And if we lose the whatever, antelope or eagle or whatever, it's going to be, you know, do permanent damage to our world. Ah, oh, and then people walk away feeling patriotic, you know, but they've also learned about endangered species that day. The last point here is the, the time. And this is kind of shocking. It should make up between five, only five and 10% of the speech. That's 30 seconds to one minute in a 10 minute speech. Um, Interesting. Once you say in conclusion, you know, people are ready for the wrap up. They want to hear a brief summary and they want to be left with something to think about, but they don't want any more. Uh, do never, never, never bring up a new point in your conclusion, not in an essay, not in a speech. Um, Lori, I'm looking at you thinking about, you know, I don't know if you know this, uh, but Lori's husband teaches uh, in the philosophy department at, at NU. He's still teaching, right? Uh, yes, every other semester. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, in the writing center, we used to see a lot of his uh, assignments and he was so specific about his conclusions. The only professor I know who said, you know, your conclusion should be two to three sentences. That's it. 
you know? And I kind of admire that because he's like, don't, you know, basically he's saying, don't bore me with a long conclusion. I've read <laughs> your paper. I know what you said. Wrap it up. Tell me again quickly what you said. Closing statement, done. So same idea here. Okay. <laughs> we have now finished this section and we're going to move on to transitions. And I can see that this is taking a little longer than I thought. I, I warned Lori about that. But um, the next few sections are a bit quicker. Anyway, let's stop for a moment. This was the longest section here on introduction, body, and conclusion. Let's stop for a second here and see if there are any questions. Maybe not. <laughs> okay, so then I'll move on. Next thing I want to talk about is transitions. Um, approach transitions differently in public speaking than you would in academic writing. A speech is not an essay. Um, so you can see a theme is forming here. Uh, let's see the difference. In writing, we're looking for subtle, smooth, elegant, almost imperceptible transitions. Um, such a nice smooth flow like ice skaters during the Olympics. Um, we, we, want sign, we don't want signposting, we want to avoid it. Firstly, secondly, thirdly, it's just too rough. Uh, it's too raw in, in good writing to do that. High school students can do it, but um, not college age students and beyond. In speaking, however, it's the opposite. Um, we, we want our transitions to be conspicuous. Conspicuous means it stands out. It's clearly visible. It's the opposite of subtle. Um, simple, repetitive, uh, almost boring, you know? Because again, this is good for your audience. It helps reinforce your ideas. And unlike writing, signposting for a second, third is encouraged. Again, for the audience's sake. So I, I could ask you again, well, what, why is this? But I've, I've answered it already. The audience has one shot. So this helps guide them through. Think of giving a speech kind of like walking a five-year-old across a busy street. You want to hold their hand through the whole thing so they don't get lost or injured. Um, OK, let's take a look. Um, at some examples here. You definitely have to single, signal the move from the introduction to the body. Uh, a lot of students miss this one. So the introduction just bleeds straight into the body. How do you do this? Well, usually in the introduction, you're gonna end with a preview of points. So today I will, I will you know, first explain X and then Y and then I'll explain Z. So, Right after that, you would say, I'd like to begin by X, or let's begin with X. And then everybody knows, they feel comfortable. Okay, we've moved from the introduction. Now we're at body point one, because again, they're not looking at an outline of your speech. Signal the move from the body to conclusion. Warn them that you're getting toward the end. Again, wake them up, give them one last chance to hear a summary of your main points. In conclusion, in closing, um, so, but, but say it once. I, I remember listening to a graduation speech again while I was in Myanmar and this, this speaker said in conclusion, I think it was five or six times and you could see the audience kind of sit up like, oh, I, I was falling asleep again. Oh, okay. The conclusion is here. And then we'd all sit down again and kind of relax and then you say in conclusion and then we would all sit up. So anyway, say it once. <laughs> Use the combination of what we call internal summaries and internal previews between main points in the body. So what does this look like? Uh, here's an example. I've explained X, now let's continue with Y. And then when you've done X and Y, you can say, um, I've, I've talked about X and I've talked about Y, now let's move on to my final point, Z. Again, you're holding the hand of the reader. This may sound crude, it may sound simple, it may sound repetitive, but your audience in their heart is thanking you because they're, they're, they're following you every step of the way. 
Um, use signposts in between main points or sub points. Um, so if you have a, a topic that lends itself to numbers, you know, like I'm gonna give you three reasons, then you can number those main points. But often we use signposting uh, for sub points uh, within main points. So here's an example, first, second, third, or first, next, finally. Um, let me point out here that a common mistake is mixing these. But imagine how confused the audience can feel when you say first, next, thirdly, you know, because, well, two, uh, did you say two or not? Um, I, I forget. So if you start with numbers, stay with numbers. If you got three points and you don't want to use numbers, you can say first, next, and finally. Okay. All right. So now we're going to move on to the last two sections of this speech. Lori, is this okay? Are we doing all right? Yes, we're good. Yep. We're good. It's okay. 20 to nine. Yep. All right. So, so great. These last two sections are a little bit shorter um, and a little bit fun, I think. Uh, vocal delivery, I've got four tips and physical delivery, I've got four tips for you. So um, these are remember to pause, uh, vary your volume, vary your rate, and vary your pitch. Oh, were there any questions on the last section on transitions? I, I forgot to ask you guys. I don't see any. Also, uh, we can have a question a question period at the end. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So then maybe these last two sections we'll just kind of go through. So um, let's let's look at each of these. At a, uh, take a closer look at each of these. Okay. Okay. Wow. Boy, was I nervous there. It wasn't clicking. It wasn't moving. Ah. So <laughs> remember to pause. Um, <clears throat> before I even get into examples of, of pauses, let me say, or let me give you a quote from, from Mark Twain, a famous American author. He has a lot of funny quotes, but this is a really good one about, and it's very serious. No word is as effective as a properly placed pause. No, and this is a writer saying that no word is as effective as a, uh, as a you know, a properly placed pause. He was also a public speaker, by the way. But anyway, it's very true. And in fact, often people complain about speakers and they say, oh, they're speaking too fast. I can't follow. Often the problem is not that they're speaking too fast. The problem is that they're not pausing. They're not pausing where there's a comma. They're not pausing between sentences, you know, at the full stop. The audience, again, needs time to process this. They're not reading a script. They can only hear you. So they need to you know, digest your material. There are many different types of pauses, and I'm going to talk about five of them here. If you want to follow up to this, search the web for the power of the pause, and you'll find websites where people talk about 20 different pauses, seven different pauses, five. I'll give you five today, uh, types of pauses. So the punctuation pause one to two seconds. That may seem like a long time, but to the audience, again, you're doing them a favor. So if it's a comma, maybe one half to one second. If it's a period, uh, one to two seconds. The emphasis pause, two to three seconds. Um, this is when you really want to emphasize something. You, you, it's a bit dramatic, you know, like uh, I might say, um, you can see I've, I've taken notes here. I, I came up with some good examples for you. Um, <laughs> math is important. Science is important. But the most important course you'll ever take is public speaking. So <laughs> you can see the drama coming. In. Hey, thank you. And <laughs> You can see what that does to people. They're, they're sitting on the edge of their chairs wondering, you know, so it's an emphasis pause. Uh, use it, get, get familiar with it. These things work. I mean, they really work. Uh, rhetorical question pause. I mentioned this before. Uh, don't cheat the audience. Don't deprive them of the opportunity to think if you're going to give them a rhetorical question, you know. Have you ever wondered about global warming? I know you have, we all have. Um, well, wait a minute. No, 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 no. <laughs> or have you ever thought about a simple solution that you can contribute to 
uh, making global warming go away. You know, you really need to think about that one. So count three to seven seconds, give them that time to think. And don't be afraid that people are going to stand up and answer the question and, and then you'll be in trouble. Um, people understand rhetorical questions, you know, unless they're crazy people who want to stand up in the middle of your, your speech. Okay, um, the reflective pause, three to seven seconds. Um, this is when you say something that the, that the audience needs to reflect on, kind of like the statistic I gave you before about 20% of all women being sexually abused. You, know, you might want to say that twice and then pause and let people, let it sink in and let the people do their own math. My God, out of every five women I know, like one of them is gonna be abused at some point in their life. I'm, I'm horrified, you know, let them be horrified instead of horrifying them. Um, and this last one is the, I'm in thought pause. And I say, take as long as you need. The I'm in thought pause is kind of the opposite of the reflective pause. This is giving you time to reflect. Um, some speakers use this to take like, to have like a profound look. You know, you'll see this sometimes in TED Talks, you know, they'll pause and they'll look somewhere and then they'll go on with their speech. But the best thing about the I'm in thought pause, if you can master it, is that, uh, you know, invariably you will reach a point in your career as a public speaker where you're going to forget something. You're going to lose track of where you are. And instead of saying, um, 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 if you can master the I'm in thought pause, you can just take a, take a pause and stare out into the audience confidently until you can pick up where you left off. Okay. <laughs> Questions? No, we're going to move on. <laughs> okay. I think you guys, I'm seeing the nods. I think you get it. Okay, great. Um, so vary your volume. This is pretty easy to follow. <clears throat> Raise your voice, you know, shout at the audience when shout is necessary and then get quiet. You'll be surprised how this works. I have children. It works with children. You know, sometimes when you're quiet, um, that's when they listen most. You shout and they're used to that. Um, then you get really quiet and they're like, oh no, dead serious now. Um, so <laughs> variety, uh, this engages your audience. Vary your rate, speed up, slow down, speed up, slow down. Again, it depends on your content. All of this should follow, it should have some meaning. Don't just uh, speed up for no reason at all, but you can you know, swallow some words quick and then you know, slow down. Vary your pitch. Um, make your voice go up. You know, the most important thing in life is public speaking. So uh, important, <laughs> vary your pitch or go down. Uh, let's do an example of this where we combine pause, volume, rate, and pitch. I have a little three word sentence that can be said different ways, incorporating all three of these, or all four of these things, I'm sorry, pause, volume, rate, and pitch. Um, and I would like someone to read the first one for me. And the, you know, then we can uh, uh, go with each, each one, uh, in, a different person for each one. So uh, Aisha, I'm looking at you. You want to read this one for me? I can try. <laughs> yes. Great. Um, well, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Give us more of the love. Mm. Uh, I love you. Ah, that's it. I love you. Um, so you're stressing, you're emphasizing the love. Very good. Um, you know, there was also a bit of a pause there. I love you. Uh, so we get the pitch, the volume, the rate, and the, and the pause. What does this mean? To me, this means I don't just like you anymore. I truly love you. This is what a guy says after he's been seeing a girl for three, four months. And like it wells up inside his heart and he realizes it isn't just like anymore. It's, it's taken that next step and he's thrilled about it. Um, okay, great. Yurik, you're up. Try this one. 
I love you. Ooh, beautiful, beautiful. What's the context on this one, Yurik? Uh, that means uh, my life is so uh, tremendous that maybe it's some kind of fit. <laughs> All right, that's a noble thought. My thoughts are not so noble on this one, I, I guess. Um, the translation is to me, uh, only I love you, no uh, one else. Um, Yurik, you saw your girlfriend uh, at, the, um, at the Daily Cop. Uh, you were supposed to be in class, but your class got canceled because the teacher was sick. So you go to return to, to the Daily Cup and you see your girlfriend leaning over, talking to some guy and laughing <laughs> politely. And you think, oh my God, you know, she's, she's like seeing some other guy. And later on you talk to her and you look, I love you, not that loser guy. I love you. Got it? Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the last one. Uh, who, who wants to try that? No takers? I, 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 I love you. Mm, beautiful. I love you. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, context. That's me, I, I want to do only you, yes. That's yes, me. exactly. In this case, um, your girlfriend saw you at Daily Cup. <laughs> and you were so excited to talk to this other pretty girl. And you know, oh, what were you talking to that girl about? Oh, oh, baby, I love you, not her, you know? <laughs> so all of these can be combined, you know, for, for emphasis and, it, and for meaning. It adds to the meaning. In, in this case, it actually changes the meaning. Okay. So let's move on to the last uh, section here, which is physical delivery. Again, I've got four tips for you. Make genuine eye contact. That's real eye contact, authentic eye contact. Vary your facial expressions. Use purposeful gestures and move your body. First one, make genuine eye contact. Sweep the room. By sweep the room, I mean sweep the room with your eyes. Not like radar, you know, um, basically find a few friendly faces, one here, one in the middle, one over there and move, stay focused on that person for a while and then move, you know, so you're sweeping the room uh, from side to side, slowly, sentence by sentence. And if it's a big room, choose somebody in the front and somebody in the middle and somebody in the back as well. This works because it gives the audience the impression that you're talking to each and every one of them. It's not just those three, four faces. It's the whole group of people around them. Um, don't look through or past the audience. Uh, I see a lot of this in, in, uh, among my students uh, in, in a live situation. Now, of course, we're online, which is different. But uh, there's a lot of memorizing going on in Kazakhstan, and that's not the best thing for public speaking, but I noticed that a lot of students just, I don't know, they have to do it or something. But what happens is they'll be looking at me, for example, I'm, I'm the teacher, I'm giving the grade, but they're looking at me, but they're not looking at me. They're looking through me as if I'm a ghost. Um, and I feel like really they're looking through me and on the back wall behind me is the, 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 their speech. Their speech is all written out and they're reading it line by line. So again, make genuine eye contact, authentic contact. Eye contact. Sorry, Robert, could I just jump in? Arujan is asking, yeah. have you ever lost your train of thought while trying to make eye contact? I guess if you're concentrating on two things. Yes, um, it certainly can happen. It certainly can happen. Um, and what, what advice do I have for you? <laughs> <laughs> this is why most uh, public speaking books and teachers like me recommend having note cards, small note, note cards, not the entire speech written out on A4. No, 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 that's too small. If you have note cards with, you know, um, basic bullet points for each of the points you're trying to make. And then you get that funny feeling, you made some great eye contact and then you're like, uh-oh. Um, 
master that that I'm lost pause that we talked about before, uh, <laughs> you know, and have your cards handy, look down. People will forgive you for that in the audience. The, people in an audience are more forgiving than you think, because I think we're all terrified of public speaking, you know, in our hearts. So um, if you, you skip a beat, and then you pull up, you, know, you survive it, we're all happy. We're all happy because you pulled out of it. Okay. Vary your facial expressions. I find this one to be particularly difficult in Kazakhstan. Um, I'll never forget my first, my first few days in Kazakhstan. My first day, I walked across the street uh, all jet lagged and I, I went to uh, Mega Silkway. And I had just come from Southeast Asia. I've been living there for 10 years. And in Southeast Asia, people smile for no reason. Um, so uh, I'm walking through, and I got used to that, and I'm walking through Mega Silkway smiling for no reason, and people are like, you know, pulling their children away, from, you know, <laughs> protecting themselves from me, walking to the other side of the mall, and I was like, oh my god, nobody's expressive. Um, I find it difficult to get my students to express themselves, but you got to do it in public speaking. This is another thing that keeps the audience, uh, the audience's attention. One way I recommend to, you know, if you have trouble with facial expressions, use your eyebrows. This is the first thing that uh, I notice my students will pick up on. If they, if I have a student who's stone-faced, I recommend working on eyebrows first. Eyebrows are quite, quite, quite expressive. So, uh, you know, that's one thing. Smile when it's appropriate. I definitely don't see enough smiles going on. Um, maybe I smile too much when I came from Southeast Asia, but um, certainly I, I, I would love to see more smiles, <laughs> especially among my students when they're speaking. I say when it's appropriate because your face should match your message. That's the main point. Your face should match your message. I had a student once who loved the topic, the death penalty. And he was a stone-faced kind of guy. And he told me, you know, I, I, this is a very serious topic and I can't smile. And I said, yes, you can, you know, there are good things because you, you, you want to solve the problems, you know, of, you know, rape and, and, and whatever in your country by in, uh, getting the death penalty in there. So there's some hope. When there's hope, you can smile. What he did, unfortunately, was learn how to smile all the time. And so he went from stone face to like, hello, today my topic is the death penalty. There are many rapes and murders in this country and we need to kill these people, you know? <laughs> so face should match your message. Don't smile for no reason, but definitely treat the audience to a smile. Um, often at the beginning is, is the best place to use your first smile to warm up the audience and certainly at the closing. But throughout the speech, whenever there's a ray of hope, even in a negative uh, you know, speech, use it. Um, okay, use purposeful gestures. And um, uh-oh, I am going, we're gonna go over a little bit on the time, but this is actually the third of four points, so we're getting pretty close. Uh, I'm gonna give you a few gestures that are easy to incorporate. I know it's hard for people to incorporate gestures in, so here are a few. For numbers, use your fingers, okay? Be careful with this one. Um, throughout a speech, we often have many reasons or many examples. You know, I'm gonna give you three examples, but there's five reasons and then, you know, so don't choose one and use your fingers. Don't, every point you can't use your fingers, otherwise the audience gets overwhelmed with it all. For small versus large, use hand movements, you know. Oh, you know, it's a little tiny baby and now he's grown into a big man, uh, you know. There's been an increase in the price of oil, or there's been a decrease in the price of oil. And so uh, the Kazakhstani uh, currency has gone down. So use your hands to show these things. It helps your audience follow. And it, again, it keeps them alert. Um, indicate division, use different hands. You know, there are Democrats and there are Republicans and they don't look at it the same way. There are men and there are women, <laughs> two types of people on earth and they don't look at things the same way, at least from my experience in my relationship with my wife. Um, <clears throat> oh, I didn't say that. Okay. Um, <laughs> to indicate unity, bring your hands together. Men and women are very different, but when they come together, 
they create a family. Okay, <laughs> Democrats and Republicans come together uh, with COVID-19 relief. Uh, indicate you, me, and we using hand gestures. Be careful not to point uh, you. Nobody likes the pointed finger at them. You, me, we, no. So always keep the open palm. Um, okay, I think that's all I wanted to say on that. Okay, so this is uh, actually from a book called Human Lie Detection and, and Body Language 101. Um, but there's, she's, she's on a few YouTube videos if you want to see her. She's got uh, a few other good ideas as well. This is just, again, I, I take the high points here for this uh, prediction lecture. This is my last point. So it's not just your, your arms that can be used for gestures. Your whole body can come, come become a part of this. And here is, if you have trouble moving, this is a good way to start. Um, natural movements are good. And if you see good TED Talks, these people are, are you know, they've spoken before or they've practiced a lot. And, and the best ones look very comfortable on stage. But there is this basic speaker's triangle that you can follow when you're just trying to, to get into the, the idea of, of using your body. Uh, what's great about this is that you're actually using your body to reflect the movement from one point to the next and then moving for your conclusion. So you see the three in H, that means the third point, but also it's your kind of your home, yeah? So you begin there with your introduction, then you, you move to the right and you make your, your first point there. You move to the left, you make your second point there. And then you can come home and make your third point. You might even take a step forward for your conclusion. So um, I'm just teaching my students this. Uh, I looked at their last speeches, I had them record and a lot of them are very robotic and mechanical. It will be the first time, that's okay. But the idea of getting yourself moving for that first speech, you know, it'll become more fluid and natural in the second, third, fourth, fifth speeches. Bob, could I just ask, is the audience meant to be at the bottom of the page here or at the top? Like, are I'm, you? Good, good point. Yeah, at the top of the page. So okay. you're moving out into the audience for point number one. You're getting closer to your audience. You see what I mean? Okay. Um, this is great for me, actually when I look at this, uh, because normally at NU, I teach in, what is, I forget the numbers of those rooms with the, you know, kind of on the first floor of, of uh, uh, you know, block eight, there are those two kind of like amphitheater rooms. You know what I mean? I think so. Okay. I hope, hopefully, yeah. So, so, you know, our students, when, when we deliver there, they physically move forward and they're addressing one side and then the other side. But I'm glad you brought that up because there's one other point I want to make. When you make that move, you know, toward this side of the audience, do not turn your face and speak only to them. In fact, walk over there and shift your body so that you're looking at the entire audience this part of the audience is closest to you, but you're also seeing the whole thing, okay? And the same is true when you go to point two, move over here, but also, you know, address the whole audience. I've seen many students when they first practice this, um, you know, the right side of the room gets point number one. <laughs> the left side of the room gets point number two. <laughs> and then point number three, everybody gets. And the conclusion, everybody gets. So avoid that. Avoid that. OK, this was my, my, my final point. And um, all I have left to say is uh, happy presenting to all of you. And if you have any questions, now is the time to ask.